Hey everyone, my name is Vincent Camulia. I'm a clarinet player and teacher here in Las Vegas. And today I'd like to talk about a sort of way of thinking when it comes to clarinet playing. And it's to think more like a vocalist when playing the instrument. And the term is vocalizing, right? Um, what I would love to hear from younger clarinet players is a bigger tone and a more open color, right? I hear a lot of tension in young clarinet players, myself included, right? I know there can be a lot of nerves when it comes to playing, especially in front of teachers, right? When there's pressure. Um, and this can cause our tones to collapse and get thin and tight. And we have to consciously counteract that reaction to nervousness by opening up. And the term vocalizing has been a very helpful tool for me to help counteract those nervous feelings of that result in tightness. Um, this term, vocalizing, was brought up to me by my teacher at USC when I was studying there in 2014. His name is Yehuda Gilad, fantastic teacher, and he always was looking at the big picture about how to approach the instrument. And he loved to use this term vocalizing. And he would always talk about, you know, singing, you know, almost making your head resonate. It was always about how you're using your air on the inside of your body. Um, and it was rarely about the way to control your sound with your embouchure. And that always resonated with me. And that's something I've carried on to my teaching and my playing to this day. So let's get into the idea of vocalizing. There are three key, I guess, thoughts you have to have to really unlock the helpfulness of this idea of vocalizing. First one is that you're having a relaxed throat. Um, right? We should also say having a relaxed body, especially in this zone, right? Your diaphragm, your lungs are meant to push air out of your body. And as you're pushing it out, nothing from here to here should get in the way. But a lot of us, myself included, we will tighten up here, which squeezes the tone. We'll tighten up in the back of our mouths. And then by the time the air gets to our mouths or to our embouchure, our mouthpiece, it's already been squeezed and compressed. And it doesn't have this relaxed sort of you know, full tone to it. It's, you know, it's thin. So you have to learn how to relax, right? It takes time, but it's something you have to think about. So first one, relaxed throat, everything. Second one, which is a reaction or a, you know, an effect of the first is flexibility of tone and color. And right? if you can allow your body to open up and be vocal and sing and push your air out of your body that will allow different tone colors to come out right you have a big column of air that you're blowing into your reed um that's just more activity more action that's going to make your reed really come to life um so really open up really try to not restrict your air as it goes through your body until you get to the front of your embouchure, right? That's where you focus it to get it through the little hole in the front of your instrument, right? But until it gets here, you have to open. Let the air be flexible. Okay, third thing, power or energy in your airstream. All right, you get that power as a, you know, it just, you know, comes along with relaxing. Right? The more you relax, the stronger you can push air out of your body. So your tone becomes more relaxed and more powerful. All right. So I've always found it helpful by the advice of all my teachers in college. Undergraduate, Steve Cohen, Lori Bloom, and graduate school, Yehudi Kilad, and David Howard, and my teacher, so when I grew up here in Las Vegas, Dr. Sturm and Marty Reduns was to play like you're a singer, right? Listen to the good singers of the mid 20th century because they really knew how to create beautiful sounds with their bodies. 
they didn't have you know production engineers mastering engineers who knew how to fix problems it was just their voice to a microphone to the tape recorder so i've grown up listening to a lot of old singers and sort of stealing what they do listening to their tone color trying to copy what the great singers do so what is it that they do that makes their voice pleasant all right these are five things that in my mind are what makes singers great and that we need to copy in our own tones okay go through them quickly we have body body means right like size not just a thin sound it should be big it should be round it should be should take up space right you should be unapologetic about the way you sound all right just put it out there and if you get the hand from your director right don't take it personally it's just a it's a balancing thing right you should still feel free to push your sound out brilliance okay brilliance you could also say brightness or you know it can be sparkly but you need this to have those high frequencies, those bright sounds in your tone to really cut through and to have clarity. It's like when you're talking and you need someone to hear you. You have to have articulation. But if you have brightness in your tone, that can carry through and that will be a better option than, let's say, over-articulating, which, which is not very becoming to a clarinet sound, right? It can make it sound nerdy. Okay, third thing, nuance, right? Talked about it before, different colors in your tone. The less you're just one or two dimensional in your tone, the more interested the audience will be. Okay, flexibility, already covered that. Color, already kind of covered that. Cool. So, before we get on to the clarinet specifics, I would like to play for you two of my favorite singers. First one is my favorite. It's Ella Fitzgerald, and it's a song called It's Only a Paper Moon. Okay, so I want you to listen for these five things, like the brilliance, tone color, body. Where is it? Oops, messed up those. Body, brilliance, nuance, flexibility, and color. Okay. Think about which of these sort of adjectives can describe Ella Fitzgerald's sound. Okay, here we go. Say it's only a paper moon Sailing over a cardboard sea But it wouldn't be make-believe if you be Amazing. All right. So, Ella Fitzgerald, let's revisit these terms. She definitely has brilliance, right? She can play with this unforced brightness and like crisp quality to her voice, right? That as a clarinet player can be tough. Right? It can be tough to let it be resonant and full and bright without pushing. Right? Especially when we get above the high G, it's easy to tighten up and force these notes out. Right? But listen to the way she just lets them ring naturally. Say it's only a paper moon sailing over a cardboard sea. But it wouldn't be make-believe if you believed in me. Yeah, great stuff. Okay, so she definitely had the brilliance. She has flexibility because you can hear her voice. There's not much tightness. She's very relaxed. She's very comfortable when she's singing. And that comfort manifests, it manifests itself in all of these things second 
singer I want to play for you. It's Antonio Carlos Jobim, and he's singing with a famous guitar player, Joao Gilberto. Um, I'm sure you've heard him on Girl from Impanima. Um, this song um, really highlights a quality that I would love to hear more in clarinet playing, especially myself. It's the ability to have a sort of big kind of dark, round, buttery, warm tone when you're playing quietly. Often we can fall into the trap of playing with a thin tone also when we're playing really quietly, right? We'll like think, oh, it's small, it's quiet, so let's go small. But really there's no reason why a quiet sound should come across as smaller. It should just be less, right? It should still be big. It should just be less sound, okay? So let's hear this song. De umas coisas que eu não posso acreditar Doce é sonhar, é pensar que você Gosta de... Ok. Let's see. Body. Definitely had body, right? Just like Ella Fitzgerald singing. Antonio Carlos Jobim was able to sing effortlessly, but not have a small sound. It was big, it was colorful, right? You're getting the idea, right? You don't want to be tight in your airstream. You want to vocalize. You want to keep it open. Trust that whatever is inside of you and when it comes out musically is good, right? You don't want to hold it in and keep it tight. Um, good. Okay, let's get on to the clarinet specific thanks. How to practice vocalizing. First one, I'm sure a lot of you have heard from your teachers already. You have to sing. Okay, I've had the luxury to have a car for a few years. So when I was sitting in traffic in Los Angeles, um, when I was at USC, I would just sing in the car for hours. You know, it passed the time. Um, so I had that opportunity to be in my own space for an hour. It was like my own practice room. So I would sing. I'd become, I'd listen to a great singer. I would try to emulate them. I'd fail miserably. Um, I'd try again the next day in rush hour traffic, fail miserably. And then slowly I would sort of develop this sense of body awareness of how to use right this part of my body where it goes from your lungs out your mouth to create a beautiful vocalized tone. So wherever you can find that space to sing, whether it's going for a run, whether you're comfortable singing in your house with other people listening to you. Um, if you are more power to you, I can never do that. Um, right in the gym, wherever it is, right. Practice singing. It will have beneficial effects on your clarinet playing. The second thing you've touched on that strong air, relaxed body, right? The less your muscles can tighten up and get in the way, the more strength and flow of air you have going into your clarinet, and you sound better. Here we go with the 80-20 rule. This is something I made up about two hours ago, but it's based off of a concept that I've been aware of for many years. And it's the 80 is your air, the 20 is your articulation and your embouchure. Okay. It means you should approach clarinet playing 80% as just the act of blowing air from your lungs out your mouth. And then secondary, tertiary ideas should be your embouchure and your articulation and your fingers. Yeah. Let's give some examples. If I'm 50% fingers and tongue, 50% air, it can come across very articulate and kind of forced and not vocal enough. So I'll give you that now. Heavy tongue, heavy fingers. Now 
now. Let's try an 80-20. 80% air, 20% everything else. So 10% fingers, 10% tongue. Well, I guess no embouchure. Let's say 1% embouchure, 9% tongue. Much smoother, more vocal, right? More based on vowels, less based on T's, right? That t -t articulation sound. It's not as good as the sound of air moving through your clarinet. Okay, good. 80-20 rule. Um, those are three ideas. There are many more, but, you know, I don't want to keep you here all day. Um, last piece of advice I'll pass along is a book. My brother introduced this book to me. My brother is a flute player who lives in Germany. His name is Francesco. He goes by Frankie. But um, it's called the... Tone Development Through Interpretation, um, written or compiled by Marcel Moyes, a famous oboist from mid-20th century. And this book is full of, let's say, 16 to 24, 32-bar excerpts um, that are transcribed from mainly operas. And it is a like an alternative etude book where you can work on your tone, right? Tone development. Um, it's not as focused on technique. The technique is relatively easy as long as you practice, you know, your scales and all that. Um, it's pretty easy, right? So they've transcribed the vocal parts from operas to, for woodwinds to play. So you get to focus on tone, right? You're not focused on shedding and working on, you know, it's not that kind of stuff um, it's more like Not so technical. More fun. It's a good alternative to your typical Rose etude book, your close A method book. All right. Marcel Moy's tone development through interpretation. Okay. Final thing. Let's talk about some clarinet players that I respect a lot and I would recommend you to listen to to learn on from them the way they vocalize. Here we go. Martin Frost, wizard. Benny Goodman, the classic, classic clarinet player. I still think he's the best. I would actually like to put him up here, but hey, whatever. Um, Eddie Daniels, another jazz clarinet player. Plays very free, very open. Marina Sturm, teacher at US UNLV. Fantastic, big, nice, dark tone. And very vocal. Very, very vocal. And then Mark Dover. New York-based clarinet player who plays in the Imani Winds Quintet. Just a fantastic musician and always inspiring hearing his tone. It's almost like he's taken the clarinet and evolved it, or it's not even a clarinet. Like, it's too good to be a clarinet. And so those are the five. That's my video on vocalizing. Hope you learned something, and thank you for watching.